Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everybody. Today on the show, we have Dan Lawton. Dan Lawton is a mindfulness instructor and writer with a specific interest in the adverse effects of meditation practice. Dan is a certified instructor in mindfulness-based stress reduction through Brown University and spent four years teaching meditation in New Orleans. Dan spent a decade practicing meditation, primarily in the Western insight traditions, and completed roughly 15 silent retreats. He now mentors other meditators struggling with adverse experiences through the organization Cheetah House. Before teaching meditation, Dan worked as a newspaper reporter in California and Louisiana. He's written about his own adverse experiences from meditation. And you get to hear part one of my conversation with Dan now. I'm very happy to have Dan Lawton with me today on this show. We're going to be talking for a while, which I'm so happy about because there's so much to talk about. I got your name from Nitai, who is a previous guest on the show and a friend and an all-around good person. So I would love for you to introduce yourself and then we'll start talking. So my name is Dan Lawton. Uh, I live in New Orleans. And I guess what's going to be most germane for our conversation is I've spent the last 10 years intensively meditating in Buddhist traditions, primarily what we might describe as Vipassana or American insight. And for the last four years, I worked as a mindfulness-based stress reduction teacher. And I mean, I guess we'll, we'll probably dive into some of, some of the experiences that I've had. And I guess what, what brings me to the podcast, I continue to work in that capacity as a mindfulness teacher in some different ways. And then I also have experience as a, as a reporter and I've worked in a, a number of other different fields as well. And um, I'm excited to have this conversation and excited to, I guess, really explore the messy world of, of mindfulness. Yes, because it is a messy world. I was working as a school counselor for a while at a school and they paid somebody to come in and do mindfulness training. Some of the kids benefited from learning how to just spend time being, not having to do and being able to reflect and managing and modulating and figuring out how to handle certain emotions as they come up. And others, I noticed, found it very agitating. They didn't like having to sit still. They didn't understand the point of it. It actually made them, when they went out to the playground after, they were running around more. Like they had, they had stored up too much energy sitting still for too long. So it became clear just in that alone, without it being kind of a meditative practice, that it works for some and not for others. And what I've seen in my field over these many years is that when you have sort of the same pill to offer everyone, it's going to work for some and not for others. And what you want to do is you want to have the insight to know that you shouldn't just be giving them more of the same pill or make them feel like they're not doing it well enough or right. And so it comes back to them. So it does get messy. And I think people also don't realize that there can be some potential damage that's done over the long term of meditation. So I'm curious. I also know that you published a paper. I'd love for for people to be able to first hear about that and where they can find that. About two months ago, I, I published a fairly long essay on, on Substack. The essay is entitled, When Buddhism Goes Bad, How My Mindfulness Practice Led Me to Meltdown. And it basically describes an extraordinarily harrowing and traumatizing experience I had in my own practice on an intensive meditation retreat, where I ran into a state I often call non-referential terror, where I became incredibly aware of the sensations of my body and essentially all of my thinking diminished. My executive thinking skills fell away. The boundary between myself and the rest of the world collapsed. And, you know, this experience continued into the next day when I was basically unable to turn mindfulness off. I was continuously and acutely aware of all of my bodily sensations to the point where it became agonizing and essentially paralyzing in some way. And, you know, I left that retreat and I continued to experience 
a set of symptoms that I think could easily be classified and were classified, you know, by my therapist as post-traumatic stress disorder. And so this was a rude awakening to me that after a decade of practicing mindfulness, of reaping extraordinary benefits from the practice personally, being an evangelist for the practice, that I had, you know, been really damaged by the practice that I came to love. And it led to a deep re-examination of my own involvement with American Buddhism, with the mindfulness movement in the context of, of wellness. Also like a, a deep examination of many of the other actors in this movement, you know, their various motivations, the, the different power structures that were there, the history, a lot of the confusion. I sometimes say that I'm not sure what was more unsettling to me, the symptoms that I experienced in the aftermath of this retreat, or the fact that I started to realize that I had been part of an organized religion, which I had never really comprehended during the time that I was in it. You know, it was kind of like the floor fell out from under me in some ways. And so the last two years of my life has been processing a lot of that individually and with other people and really trying to decide whether or not I still wanted to be involved in teaching mindfulness and practicing mindfulness and ultimately deciding that, that I did because I felt like the conversation needed to really shift in a way that was more informed, more mature, and I guess more connected to, you know, what we know about these practices now and less about carrying on like the historical legacy. What drew you to it to begin with? Like a lot of people, I think, you know, was suffering from what I, I don't know, I would describe as kind of just run of the mill psychological distress into my mid twenties. I, you know, I was occasionally depressed. I had social anxiety You know, I occasionally drank too much. Uh, every now and then the printer wouldn't work and I would give it a little kick, you know, those sorts of things, which uh, just became kind of fatiguing and, and they were really starting to disrupt my relationships. And I think as I moved into my mid twenties, some of the behavior that maybe felt excusable or normal at 19 or 20, no longer felt like that. And so, you know, I, I kind of realized that I needed to do something in my life. And so I started to go to, to therapists and to see a psychiatrist, take some antidepressants, kind of some basic stuff. And then I, I got connected to, to meditation actually via my father who had had, you know, some experience with the practice. And it was so powerful for me initially because of the idea that there was something I could do to be a participant in my own healing. And I love that because I felt like prior to that, I was just, you know, forced into this kind of role of, of being passive and listening to other people's ideas about how I needed to create changes in my life. But mindfulness gave me something active that I could participate in. And the benefits were instantaneous and immediate for me. You know, I would find, I would sit and meditate and my experience would be modulated. I would be much more calm afterwards, you know, so, so there were big fruits initially, and that just propelled my practice forward. A lot of people, when they first get involved and they see some benefit, they do feel very grateful to have found it. They might not be studying it, you know, the, the brain chemistry, how it works, but they're engaged in it. When it starts to have a negative impact, often that's when people start to do their research and they want to find out why it's having that impact on them. So if you ask, I think, a newer practitioner how it works or why it works, they might not necessarily know. I'm sure at this stage of the game, you know, and I would love to be able to talk to you about brain chemistry. There's also something interesting about how unifying it can be with other people who are also involved in the practice. So I think for some people, it's the sense of community that is the draw along with the practice itself. Was it that way for you? I think it was both, but probably the most powerful experience I had early on was the first meditation retreat that I sat. And I sat a, a 10 day retreat in the style of Vipassana, Essen Goenka Vipassana retreat. And these are probably the most common retreats in, in the country, maybe the world. They're held all over the place. They uh, are almost always free. They're just by donation. And, you know, there's a lot of people going through this system. And the retreats are intense. It's, it's 10 days. You're meditating 12 to 14 hours a day. You're in silence the entire time. And you're doing two practices, one in which you're focusing on your breath, the other in which you're focusing on the sensations of your body. In this retreat, the first four days were 
completely hellish for me. I mean, it was just awful. You know, it's like, why have I decided to do this? You know? And then once we started to move into this practice called the body scan, where you systematically pay attention to your body, I began to have experiences that were previously inexplicable to me. I mean, I started to notice that like memories, thoughts, and emotions from the past were just flowing out of me as I paid attention to different parts of my body. And after a number of days, this culminated in a bombastic experience where I was meditating by myself alone, went into a series of very large involuntary convulsions, something similar to like what you'd see in The Exorcist, chest bumping up and down, felt like a giant ball of suffering rise out of my belly, up into my chest and out of my mouth, unleashed the most intense blood curdling scream you've ever heard, and then spent the next three months in uninterrupted bliss. And so this was the experience that really made me a convert. And I didn't have a context and I didn't understand that experience at all. The only context that I was given in that, in that school is that we had these root complexes called sankaras. By bringing our attention to them, we uprooted them and engaged in this practice of purification. And so this is how I understood my experience. But as you can imagine, for somebody who was, I would say, an avowed secularist before this, it was mind blowing to have this experience. It reorganized like my entire reality and it essentially made me reliant upon Buddhist ideas because there was no other framework that I had at that point to explain what had happened to me. Right. Okay. And so what sort of Buddhist ideas started to speak to you? One of the ideas, right, really kind of the, the four noble truths. One, you know, that suffering is an inherent part of this existence, which I think is always powerful and just still makes sense to me, right? You know, and the, and the second that that it is our sort of our craving and our desire for experiences beyond what is there in the moment that often causes the suffering. And so then this idea becomes attached to the idea of mindfulness, i.e. non-judgmental awareness of whatever is emerging. And that through this awareness, we sort of peel back the layers of our psychology, of our trauma, of our baggage, whatever word you want to use, and of our complexes, of our conditioning, of our issues. And we sort of eventually reach some kind of core, some inner Buddha nature, some state of liberation or enlightenment or peace. And so it was very much that, that idea of being part of a process, an experiential process of personal evolution that was not necessitating faith. And that was one of the core components of SN Goenka's kind of, you know, Vipassana was that you can just come and try this. Don't believe me, just come and try it. And I, I came and tried it. And the things that happened were far beyond my understanding. And so that was the framework that I had. And it made sense at the time. It was the only thing that could explain what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Those truths are truths. And so they are going to speak to, I think, almost everyone. I wonder also about the experience you had where you talked about this ball coming out. You can't predict that that's what's going to happen. And I'm sure once it does, I'm assuming, it can feel like such a huge relief and release. And then I wonder, does it trigger kind of an addictive connection, wanting to get that high again? What does it do to you once you've had an experience like that? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, it's fair to say that I spent the next five, six years trying to recreate that experience. You want that experience again, but also you want the aftermath of that experience, which diminished over time. I think, you know, I was writing and reflecting what it felt like afterwards. And I remember being at the airport and writing something like, you know, like this salad tastes like God. Like, this is how I feel right now. Like I'm in the TSA line and it is the most beautiful, incredible experience that I've ever had. And so it was the experience, but it was also the weeks and months afterwards where I was suddenly able to observe myself sleeping for long periods of time. My awareness would track from like the moment of falling asleep all the way until I was asleep. I had access to all sorts of what felt like unconscious thoughts and emotions. You know, I felt like I had mainlined the secret truth of the universe. And so there was two elements of that that were really appealing. 
one was just a physiological shift. I went from somebody who was feeling really anxious and overwhelmed to somebody who just felt like I had this incredible stress hardiness. I could just handle anything. And the second was, I guess, maybe more of a mystical appeal that I had tapped into something big. And, and also, not just that I had tapped into something, but like that I had kind of achieved something myself. You know, there was a very um, driven kind of achievement element of this. Like, like I had did... I had done this myself, you know, this was an accomplishment in some way. And at the same time, I was like, had my own small business. I was reading a lot of books about, you know, like business and stuff like that. And so it was like, this experience became wedded in some ways with some of my ideas about like capitalism and like business building and just like achievement, you know, and like, and like how you can sort of create a mind that's incredibly sharp and refined. And so there was a lot of baggage that came along with it, but I would say, yeah, it was enticing because it offered an altered state. And it was enticing because it offered the possibility of a supercharged, superhuman mind that could do anything, engage in the mystical, and also just sort of blaze through like the kind of mundane demands of modern life. Okay. Wow. I mean, just the language is so... Um, it's so dramatic just to reflect on how you were feeling at the time. It sounds like there was this sort of afterglow that you were enveloped in this high, like a kind of a, a really wonderful spiritual hangover, but also feeling that you had other skills that you didn't before and that maybe also you couldn't achieve in any other way, which can also connect you with the practice, I think, in the community. I think about whenever I'm asked to potentially intervene, when families have a loved one who's involved in a group that they know to not be a healthy one, they will say, you know, they just got involved. We know about this group. It's not safe. We need to be able to do something. It's very hard at first to make an impact because there are these highs, these unique experiences that are being achieved and this honeymoon period where I think during that time, if someone had come up to you and said, you know, there might be some danger here, you might not want to have listened or even believed them. Would that have been right? Yeah. And I think also because the benefits were also happening interpersonally, you know, like my relationships were better also. So there was the kind of the mystical or the transcendent experiences. And then there were the experiences of suddenly I can sit in the line at CVS for 15 minutes and not get agitated because I can just focus on my breath. Suddenly I'm not in the same fights with my girlfriend anymore. And so those were, were in some ways just powerful. Yeah, very much so. Right. So day to day helping you with those moments. I wonder then, you know, of course, because we know sort of a little bit about where the story goes, that it becomes less positive, but still staying with the positive. Were there things that you felt then that you could do that sort of the the normal mortal could not do? Did you feel that you were superhuman in some ways? At the time, I was running this idiosyncratic business where companies would hire me to help them move up the rankings and search engines, right? And it was a really interesting business because you could never guarantee any success whatsoever, you know? So it was really anxiety inducing because people would pay you and sometimes it would work out and sometimes you would literally achieve nothing for them. When I came back, it was like, I no longer had that crushing anxiety of like, you know, fulfilling their expectations. Like a lot of what Vipassana promises is an ability to see clearly in some way. And that seemed to really be happening. Suddenly, my emotional experience was in alignment with my conceptual understanding of something. So I could understand, hey, I've made an agreement with this person to work on this for them and told them maybe it will work and maybe it won't work. And if it doesn't work, that's not my problem. And I could then experience that in my body in some way. So those experiences, you know, just not being caught up and captured and so much of anxiety around other people's expectations or like self-criticism seemed to sort of diminish. My social anxiety was like completely gone. I felt like comfortable in almost any situation. That was really, really powerful. And so, you know, it's interesting. You could say superhuman or also you could, I could say like, I felt maybe human for the first time, you know, like in a way that we want to feel like, I can talk to people, I can go through my life 
without feeling this sort of low grade, persistent anxiousness, like something's always wrong. And then there was a very specific experience that I was having a lot of time around craving something. So, you know, I would say be like uncomfortable, like maybe I'm sitting on an airplane and it's like hot and stuffy and, and you know, noisy. And there was this ability to bring my attention to those experiences. And as I focused on them, whatever negative quality was there would just like be disabled immediately. And that was incredible. I mean, it, that really was like a superpower. Like my attention was so powerful that it could slice through anything that was disrupting me. And I was walking around with that attention like, like I had like a giant sword. Incredible. And that can make you certainly walk taller in the world and certainly feel more able. And I think that's a gift that everyone should be able to, to receive, either through just having friends who support them, having uh, achievements, being able to keep things in perspective, whatever helps to make you feel that you're more capable and able and not as agitated, not as reactive. Before we go into sort of that feeling of calm, like that it reduced your stress and mm, also if something didn't work out, it just didn't work out and you weren't racked with uh, a sense of guilt or you know, responsibility, or you could kind of put it aside. Before we get to that, just for people to understand with Vipassana, can you just describe the techniques, how they might be different from others? What makes it unique? Yeah. So Vipassana is a word that is in the language of the Buddha, which is this language of Pali, right? It's a, it's a dead language. Nobody speaks it anymore. It's often used synonymously with mindfulness. But essentially, it, it describes a number of techniques that you would find in a part of the Buddhist Dharma called the Satipatthana Sutta. And so this is a range of techniques where you focus on specific parts of your experience in specific ways. So you would point your attention at something like the sensations in your body, right? Or your thoughts, or your emotions, or the feeling tone of an experience. Is it pleasant or unpleasant? And what you're trying to see are all of these links between these different experiences and the way that they push you or pull you in certain ways. So the specific technique that I spent the most time with is called the body scan, where you would systematically move your attention from the top of your head to the tip of your toes trying to feel any sensations in each part of the body and trying to do that in a non-judgmental way. So coolness, tightness, tension, pleasure, pain. And as I started doing this, like I couldn't really feel a lot. And after a little while, I mean, I would be feeling hundreds, if not thousands of sensations instantaneously in each part of the body and develop the capacity to scan the whole body in one breath. So, I mean, there are a lot of other ways that you can practice, but, but this is this is the technique that I use the most. I probably use the body scan for thousands of hours. And so what you're trying to see there, right, is you're trying to see a couple of what we would call like the key, like marks of existence in Buddhism. One, you're trying to see suffering, dukkha, and you see it often by the way that you experience unpleasant things and you want to push them away. And you experience something that is pleasant and you want to pull it closer to you. Right? You become aware of that. And then the second characteristic that you see is called anatta, and this is the sense of like no self, that there, that there is nothing really permanent here as you begin to deconstruct your experience. It's all just made up of these various sensations, emotions, and thoughts. There's no solidity. This is reinforced by this idea of anicca, of impermanence, that everything is coming and going and you know waxing and waning. And the whole kind of uh, moment, each, each moment is imbued with this characteristic of sort of instability. And you can come into connection with that instability and that sort of flow. So these ideas and these practices really play off each other and are inextricably intertwined because, you know, somebody might tell you like that everything is impermanent and you're like, well, that's kind of an interesting idea. But if you go sit in the dark and focus on your bodily sensations for 90 minutes and you watch, you know, huge, arisings of coolness or warmth, they're tingling, come and go nanosecond by nanosecond. Now you've got a real felt experience of impermanence. And if you're sitting there and you're really feeling like you're, whatever your sense of self was, is deconstructed, 
now you really start to say, wow, like a nada, I really have no permanent fixed self. So, I mean, I think in my experience at Vipassana, the core features were the techniques and the way that they allowed me to essentially deconstruct my experience, desolidify it, and then also the doctrine, which gave me a specific idea of what was supposed to happen and what ultimately I did experience. And of course, that there's a lot of questions that emerged there, you know, because I was getting both of those things simultaneously. So it wasn't as if I, if somebody just gave me the techniques and then I said, guess what? I just experienced like, you know, impermanence, no self and suffering. I was told that I would experience that. And then I was giving the techniques. And then there was an infusion between the technique and the dogma, which created, you know, the experience. Wow. Okay. Thank you. What I think is really interesting too, is when you talk about being so aware, what I've dealt with, because I come at this sometimes in, uh, you know, with families who are trying to get their loved ones to kind of be more aware of what's happening around them, but they're involved in a practice that's making them uh, less reactive, more in, internally focused, not necessarily externally in some situations. And it can make them miss at times what's happening around them. And also that there is a frustration that comes for some people where they notice not only is there a calm, but there is a kind of uber passivity and they're wanting their loved one to still have a reaction to what's happening, or they will be interacting with somebody who might be running a particular meditative practice who they think is not trustworthy. And that person will say something akin to what you were saying, you know, well, you know, if there's a problem here, that's really on them or that's on you. And so there's this redirection without taking responsibility. And so that's where it gets problematic, I think. And I'm wondering if that's something that you noticed as well, like in these kinds of situations, if someone were really to have a negative response to it, would there be kind of a pushing away of a responsibility for creating that? Yeah, this is a great question and will allow me to take off on a a few of my favorite points. So yes, yes, there would be, right? often in a situation in which someone describes an experience that moves against the framework that has been suggested. Like I'm having an experience and it's not the experience that you told me that I would have. I'm becoming more aware of my bodily sensations and I'm not feeling ease or I'm not feeling comfort, right? Then typically there is a, there's a sort of a reinforcement or a doubling down on the framework and not so much an acknowledgement of the fact that this person's lived experience might just be different and something might be happening that the framework is not speaking to. And so then the question becomes, why does this happen? What are the factors that are powering this? And I think the first thing that I come back to is the tremendous confusion that we have between the aims of Buddhism and kind of the aims of Western wellness culture. And this was something that I myself was confused about for years. I mean, I was often operating under the mistaken assumption that the point of Buddhism, the point of, you know, Vipassana was to be calmer, happier, have better interpersonal skills, you know, be less stressed out. And I remember asking this question to a Buddhist scholar a couple of years ago, I asked him a question of like, would you say that the goals of early Buddhism were in alignment with the goals of modern mental health? And he said, Well, that's like an impossible question because at that time, the concept of mental health wouldn't have even existed. And so, you know, Buddhism is predicated upon soteriological goals like escaping your next life and not being reborn. And for a long time, people who were doing intensive meditation practice were doing it for that reason. And many of the other people who were involved in Buddhism weren't meditating at all. Often they were, you know, doing devotional practices where their primary relationship to the faith was just a a cultural one. And so it was really only, you know, in the 1950s that the Vipassana movement emerged in Burma as a sort of reform movement, which was kind of connected to a, a pushback against colonialism, and then spread to the U.S. And as it spread to the U.S., it began to merge, you know, with modernism in a very specific way, where suddenly the features of Buddhism 
which would be unpalatable to kind of secular modernists, deities, ghosts, the supernatural, those become de-emphasized or they become psychologized in some ways. And then Western ideas about this practice being integral in wellness culture, those sort of ascend. And so a new religion in some way is created. The scholar David McMahon calls this Buddhist modernism, which can essentially be described as a religion of its own. It has very different features. And so here we have people who are practicing meditation and their goal is stress reduction. And they're not wearing robes and they're often not interested in like all of the monastic ideas, but they're dropping into practice and perhaps taking some of the language and they're finding a way to connect it you know, to their lives. And then, you know, as therapists and psychologists start to become aware of the benefits of this practice, it continues to become, you know, more abstracted and more decontextualized from traditional Buddhist practice. And so now there's kind of two arguments that people will make for this. People who are kind of Buddhist fundamentalists will say, you know, this is a huge problem. We've taken these practices and we've approached appropriated them, you know, culturally in some way. And I mean, this is true, but to me, the more problematic thing is that we're basically offering up off-label treatments for mental health without telling people that they're off-label and that they were designed for something completely different. And so to get back to where this started, this becomes the challenge in these moments where somebody says, hey, I'm doing the practice the way you said that I should do it, but I'm feeling super anxious and overwhelmed. Well, this practice was not designed to make you feel less anxious and overwhelmed. It was designed for you to become enlightened so you wouldn't have to be reborn, you know? And it's powered by all of these ideas connected to the afterlife. So the meditation teacher ends up in a strange place because there's like, you know, a lot of mixed messages here. You're trying to deliver a product that was designed for something else. And if everybody's not fully aware of that, that's where you run into these problems, where instead of saying something like, hey, this is a religious and spiritual practice that we're using here, and it's not always going to achieve goals of wellness, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't, and it may not be the best practice for you, and here are some other ways that you can do the practice that are maybe better for your nervous system, and it might be possible that you don't even need to be at this retreat or do these practices. They may be contraindicated from you, just like we would with a medication, right? If somebody comes back after a week of taking a medication and says, hey, I'm having a lot of side effects. We don't say, well, it's because you're taking the pill wrong. So this is the moment, I think, where the fatal flaw can be made and the most damaging thing can be said, which is that suddenly, you know, the teacher says, you're not meditating right. You're not doing the practice right. You're craving another experience too much. You're unwilling to just be with what is happening right now, you know? And and you need to put more effort in. You need to put more energy in. You need to surrender more. You have doubt one of the five hindrances. You have doubt in the practice in some way, and this doubt you know, is polluting your experience. And so there's a, a whole host of unhealthy things that can be said in this moment. And the reality is that typically the person who is saying them is not somebody who's a psychologist, it's not somebody who's a therapist, it's not somebody who has mental health training, it's somebody whose expertise is in Buddhism, and they're often working with somebody whose desire is to get a treatment for anxiety or depression or stress. This is the mismatch, and this is one of the core problems. One more thing before you go. Dan has been through a lot, and I know that when people talk about their experiences, it can be upsetting. And so I give him and a lot of other people credit for wanting to get back into sort of the darker parts of their history. Before I talk about Dan, though, I wanted to mention that Dan, like Willoughby Britton, the Dr. Britton, who I interviewed a few weeks ago, they talked about not being accepted if they had a differing opinion about mindfulness or meditation, that somehow that set them apart from the community, like They were saying something wrong or being a traitor. And Dr. Britton talked very openly about the harassment that she's gotten because she has not said mindfulness is a bad practice, but she had said that you want to be mindful 
about how you use it and how you teach it because it can affect people in different ways. And in response to her talk, it got many listens on the podcast, but I also got some responses that were very negative with people giving a one or two star review to me on the podcast because of what I was somehow promoting, that I was somehow taking people's ability to have mindfulness uh, and use the techniques away from them. Never would I take away something that is useful to you. So just for clarification, even though I'm pretty sure we made it really, really clear, but I know there is a reactivity that happens with people who are afraid that something is being defamed, that they want to be able to see as perfect, or that they want to make sure that people get something out of, that all we're saying is sometimes the medicine that works for one person doesn't work for another person, or sometimes The dosage you give to one person, you don't give to another person. That's it. So I am hoping that the conversation with Dan Lawton does not trigger the same responses. And if it does, please know that part of your response is out of fear somehow that it's taking something away from you. But we would never do that. What I think is important to talk about that Dan mentioned was that there can be an interference in executive functioning skills when you are doing a lot of meditation or mindfulness, when you are doing something to an extreme, when you are in a certain mode and you're made to stay in that mode for a long stretch of time. And when we talk about executive functioning skills, they incorporate critical thinking. It also is something that helps you get through the world with being able to think clearly, not be so bothered by something that you can't ignore it enough in order to function. I mean, just to name a few, when we talk about critical thinking or executive functioning skills, we're talking about having a working memory, being able to do time management. And that's an interesting one because A lot of people who meditate for long stretches of time lose perspective of time. And task initiation, being able to get the motivation to be able to do what you want to do and start what you want to start, getting the energy for it, being able to plan, because that means sort of stepping back and looking at things objectively without emotion involved, really just being able to plan out the tasks. Having metacognition, really being able to understand things on another level, emotional control, which is something that I have seen with some people who do meditate for long stretches of time or do engage in mindfulness practice that is extreme in terms of its intensity or with the amount of time that they devote to it, that it's then hard for them to manage their emotions and they can feel more irritable, sometimes more down. Also having goal-directed persistence, really sticking with something. Because if you are in a mode very often where you are in a kind of dissociative space, your mind can go there without you realizing it more often than you'd like. And so having goal-directed persistence is so important because the persistence is the tenacious part. It's the, I'm going to stick with this until I see it through. But if your mind goes and makes sort of a journey uh, and sidesteps and kind of doesn't keep going along the same path, it's going to be a great frustration to you and it's going to be hard for you to see things through and then have a sense of accomplishment. Also, it affects memory. Because sometimes you don't remember things when you are focused on other things. And sometimes you're supposed to make your mind blank. And sometimes you're taught to have a certain mantra while you're meditating or being mindful. That takes your mind out of what you would have necessarily said to yourself. And instead, you are sharing other words and other phrases. And that's what your mind is focused on. Self-monitoring being able to really control yourself, checking in with you and being able to get a good read, problem solving, also being able to see things clearly and being able to not feel overwhelmed by issues to the point where you can't see your way out and you can't see a way to solve the problem before you. Also self-control, which is so much tied in with this emotional control, 
just blurting things out, being suddenly mad, being agitated, needing to express your agitation, and not being able to kind of calm yourself down inside enough where you can evaluate, is it worth it to be so upset about this? Or is it worth it to say this out loud? And also planning skills, adaptable thinking, not being so rigid, not saying that you have to do it this way or you have to think about it this way, but being able to compromise in your thinking and then adapt to a new situation or incorporate new information. Also planning and prioritizing what's important, what's not important, what you need to address now and what can wait. And attentional control, how long can you focus? And if you find that if you are meditating for long periods of time and that if you are involved in a mindfulness practice that actually interferes with you being able to attend to tasks, that means that you need to shift that in some way. You don't have to end it, but you do need to shift it so that you get those skills back. Because these are the skills that help you have success in the world outside the room that you're doing meditation in, outside that space. And these are the things that help give you confidence that you can be in the world in a successful way. And also that you can be taken seriously and you can be seen as a mature adult and you can come across like you can handle what is thrown at you. And I think a lot of people feel like they feel fragmented and they don't feel as capable after diving into something to this degree. So check in with yourself and remember these skills and see if you used to have them and now you don't as much. It's important that I add about if you used to have them, because if you didn't have them before, then you're not necessarily going to have them now. But if you used to have an easier time having self-control, if you used to have an easier time with planning skills or with memory or with attention, and now you don't, that means that something needs to shift so that you don't keep losing the skills that keep you in good stead in this world and in your life. Take good care. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash indoctrination.